and gentlemen, welcome back to Unarmored Talk Podcast. I am your host, Mario P. Fields. I know it's been a couple of weeks if you're on YouTube seeing this wonderful face with amazing guests and then on audio listening to this deep voice that does not fit the body, by the way. <laughs> so, to, <laughs> yeah. so today, again, we have another guest who's, you know, right, willing to remove their armor to help folks develop an accurate way of thinking. He's an international international best-selling author his book you guys can see it behind him if you're on a youtube channel if not power from the heart get go get a copy if you don't get a copy i'm going to, to be a sergeant major and take your liberty away from you <laughs> he's also you're on my side mario <laughs> <laughs> I, I got it clear with the general though right my you know that's, a, that's our little secret uh, yeah. I, I call doug the general and He's also a broker owner at Davidson Group Realty. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, Doug Davidson. What's going on, Doug? Oh, thanks, Mario. It's a pleasure to have you on here. I'm still uh, kind of soaking in our last conversation we had a couple of weeks ago, so I'm really looking forward to getting to know you a little better. Yeah, absolutely. Just again, ladies and gentlemen, he is an authentic man, and and uh, just just my quick meeting with 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 Doug, I told him I would take a bullet for him, and I told him. I'm his sergeant major forever, so he is yeah. now the general. So I will advise. <laughs> he can also take my liberty and put me in the brig if he wants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's very moving when you said that. No, I appreciate it, my friend. Can you please uh, uh, tell the listeners and viewers a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, well, I'm, I was born and raised in Montreal and lived in Montreal and many parts of Canada as I was growing up. I uh, lived in Nigeria for three years when I was a young teenager, which is a whole experience in and of itself. Wow. And gravitated down to San Diego area in the early 1990s, and uh, absolutely love it here. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, SoCal. I mean, you know, I, you know, I, just, I just came back to the Carolinas, but I sure as heck <laughs> miss that Southern California weather. Yeah, it's pretty nice. That's for sure. Yeah. It, it, it is. Well, before we jump right into the topic, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say thank you. Thank you from the bottom, bottom of my heart. Every two weeks, um, the, you know, the statistics keep increasing with views and, and how many folks are downloading, you know, and, and how many cities, new cities that the audio audio is being downloaded in. And to me, I just believe, right? I believe that it's because you all are sharing, um, not the podcast, not about Mario P. Fields, but the amazing guests uh, that are removing their armor to help other people. So please keep sharing, keep listening and viewing. And again, can't do it without you guys. Thank you. So here we go. Mario, no, can go can ahead, Doug. while we're on the subject of thanking. Um, yeah. I want to just give not only to you personally, but to all of the listeners out there who have served my sincere thank you. And I mean that sincerely. And I know that for many veterans, they hate it when people just come up and say, oh, thanks for your service. And it's right. kind of like not really genuine. And I'm just saying it from my heart. So thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for what you, you have done. I mean, a lot of folks, you know, just so you guys know, uh, Doug has has done a lot in Southern Cal for, uh, you know, for service members and, and supporting, you know, their efforts to either find homes or or to just get some necessities. So, you know, please look him up, research him. You can put him in a search engine. It'll all come up and we'll give you guys some more ways to find him. But again, I want to reciprocate it to you, Doug. Thank you for what you've been doing uh, to support first responders and service members, my friend. Thank you. And no, you, you, you're welcome. Well, I'm excited, ladies and gentlemen, and here's why I'm so pumped and excited. Doug, in 1982, check this out. He successfully <laughs> swam 2.4 miles. He cycled about 112 miles, to be exact. And then he ran 26.2 miles. 1982, Hawaii Ironman. I'm going to leave it like that. Doug, I know you just wasn't born to do all that stuff. Uh, no, <laughs> no, definitely not. I, I've been an athlete, you know, since I was four years old, I was playing organized hockey in Canada, age of four, if you can believe it. And uh, played on seven sport teams in my high school senior year. 
Um, so, you know, no stranger to athletics, but I got into endurance athletics or endurance running um, when my last year in university, and which I found to be better than beating a helmet against another guy who was bigger than me across from me <laughs> and getting beat up on the football field. Uh, endurance uh, sports seemed to fit me better. <laughs> um, and so I had run a number of marathons, a few under three hours, which is still a very respectable marathon time, but was never fast enough to compete, you know, to be a winner. Right. And for me, that just, it didn't sit very well with me. Uh, and one day I was, I was in Ottawa, Canada at the time, and I was leafing through a Runner's World magazine. And this was in 1980, and there'd only been a couple of runnings of the Ironman at that time. And so there's this whole article on the Ironman triathlon. I'd never even heard of it. And it was two page. It was a, the centerfold spread. There was three photos, you know, a swimmer, a bicyclist, and a and a runner. So you can imagine there's not a lot of room for text when you got three photos on two pages. And it just described the race. That was it. And based on reading that, at that instant in my life, I said, I'm going to do this. I had no evidence that I could do it, much to the contrary. <laughs> I had no information really on what it was going to take, but I made that decision not knowing what I was going to get into. And that was probably a good thing because I, had I known all the things that I needed to overcome at that moment in time, probably wouldn't have done it, right? Because that's kind of how we live our life. Right. We We say, well, I want to do that. And then you do all this research and you find out, what do I need to do? And then the research comes back and you go, oh, that's way too much for me. And so we just, we put the brakes on, right? I'm sure you've probably experienced that. I know I have. Um, but one of my main ways of being is that I decide what I want to do, not how I'm going to do it. I make that decision. And then from that moment, I move forward. So to give you a couple of examples of the things that I had to overcome that I didn't really know at the time. Well, there's the swim. So I'm in that time I'm in Ottawa. I eventually moved to Winnipeg, Manitoba. Neither one of great places uh, to train. Yeah, I was gonna say, so 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 you you know, you, you moved uh yeah. to, to to a place where it may be just a tad bit warmer. I don't know, in the winter time, maybe instead of negative twenty, <laughs> negative nineteen, right? No, Ottawa is warmer than Winnipeg. Winnipeg is the armpit of Canada, <laughs> and it is freezing. Um, but they did have a swimming pool there. I, you know, that was good. They had the Pan Am swimming pool. So I had a 50-meter pool to swim in. But I remember the day I decided to do the Ironman, I was dating a lady who was one of Canada's top swimmers, and I said, I'm going to do this. And she says, well, before you go and tell everybody – why don't we see if you can actually have the ability to swim 2.4 miles in the Pacific Ocean? Hey, she 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 did what uh, we always hope folks in our network would do. Okay, okay, I hear you. Nice. Yeah. Are you are you done? All right. Now yeah. let's now let's think yeah. through this. Yeah, exactly right. And so we go down in the pool, and and the club I was working at had a small indoor pool. It was maybe 20 yards long. And she went into the change room. I went in the change room. Of course, I got changed quicker. I go in the pool. I saw two lengths, and I was done. I mean, that was my workout because I was exhausted. Now, I could swim, but it was, like, not pretty. <laughs> and, I mean, to put it in perspective, she could swim on a flutter board, just kicking, no arms, and I'd be going full crawl as fast as I could, and she'd be beside me just laughing her head off. That's where I started. Wow. And then I realized that I'd never, I'd been in the ocean a couple times before, but just like sunbathing, go in, get wet, never swam in the ocean. And so I went to Hawaii 10 days before and got acclimated not only to the weather, but in the humidity, but learned to swim in the ocean because I'd done all my swimming in the pool. And so, I found out. So, 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 so wait a minute, uh, Doug. <laughs> now hold on i just want you again ladies and gentlemen yeah. you know I, i'm this is authentic i'm learning as we're yeah. was that 10 days before the actual event or or yeah and, and and what time of the year in hawaii was this event held that was in october 
So it's still humid in Hawaii. Oh yeah, yeah, it's still ninety degrees and, and you know humid and yeah, it's not. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah, so I went to jump in the ocean, you know, and of course you have all these fears of what's underneath the water, and <laughs> had to overcome all that. Um, they didn't paint lines on the bottom for me, which was a huge thing. I had to figure out how to swim straight. Right. And then there's the salt water, the taste of that, and, you know, trying not to get it in your goggles. So you're getting, you know, uh, salt in your eyes. And I mean, all these things that I had to learn in like 10 days, nine days, really. The funniest part of it, I think, though, was um, the biking. Now, I decided to do this race. And so I bought a, high, a bike in high school, a orange Peugeot bike. I think I paid $149 for it. You know, it was like just a recreational 10 speed. And I was living in Ottawa and there's a big cycling community there. And I lived on the canal and every Sunday they closed the canal and all these riders would be going by and they'd have like black shorts on. And back in the day they had, you know, wool jerseys and, helmets and gloves and looking at these guys like well, why don't I just get my bike out and go ride so I got my running shorts on my running shoes no gloves no helmet you know that like the real short running shoe or running shorts you know and uh I'm riding along the canal and this guy who's a real cyclist just blows by me like I'm just like standing still <laughs> and that of course really pissed me off excuse my French but you know, I was really quite upset by that. So, of course, what do I do? I'm competitive. I stand up on my pedals and I'm like cranking it out. Well, that extra torque caused the chain to fall off. Wow. Like, Great. So, <laughs> how do I put this back on? I have no idea. I didn't even know how to work on a bike. And I didn't have any gloves or, you know, towel to wipe my hands off. So now my hands are just like totally caked in grease and I finally got it on. I ride another couple hundred yards. It comes off again. I'm just like really upset. And then the next time it came off, it was right in front of a high-end bike store. And I'd seen that store before, but I didn't have any need to ever go in. So I wheel my bike in. Now imagine this. See, I'm in my running singlet, you know, short shorts. Hands are just like black <laughs> grease. And I said to the guy, can you fix my chain? And he says, yeah, just leave your bike here. We can get to it in a couple of days. And I said, no, 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 I need it like right now. And he said, well, what's the rush? And I said, well, I'm training. <laughs> <laughs> for what? <laughs> well, I'm training for the Ironman triathlon. And he looks at me like, well, where's your bike? <laughs> hey, 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 Doug, he started asking you questions. Uh, okay, what's your full name? Uh, yeah. <laughs> do you know who's the current president? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? And uh, he he was just like, he was pretty, he was, he thought it was pretty funny. So he said, well, tell you what, leave the bike here, come back at four o'clock today. I'll have your chain fixed and I'll take you on a ride and you can ride my bike and I'll ride yours. So I go back at four and he gives me this bike that weighs half of what I, mine was, Get the skinny little tires and, you know, and all this and he gives me a pair of shoes so that I can actually use the cleat on there. And and I, it's like going from a Honda Civic to a Lamborghini. You know, I mean, it was a massive, massive change. I didn't know how to deal with it, but I, I went in, we did. And I said, well, what does something like this cost? And it was $1,500 for a used frame and new components. Wow. And at that time, I was making, it's almost embarrassing to say, 15000 a year. Right. So it's 10% of your income. Imagine, you know, dropping 10% of your income on a bike. And I didn't have the money, so I called my dad, and I said, Dad, you know, can I borrow some money? What for, Dad? You know, well, I want to buy a bike and go in the Ironman. He hadn't heard any of this yet because this was all so new. And he says, well, sure. You're like, you need a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> hey, hey, that's like, hey, so no worries. Uh, yeah, 50, yeah. You know, sure. 75 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. 1500 is like, oh, after you'd already committed, he would let me. <laughs> so, you know, I paid all that back, but I had to learn how to fix the a flat on the go. 
I had to learn how to, you know, maintain my bike. Because in the race, in a way, if you get any help at all, you're automatically disqualified. So I could take the bike completely apart, put it all back together again. And, you know, we didn't have back in the day the internet where you could Google something or go to a YouTube video. Like, how do you do that? So I bought this little book in the bookstore, you know, everybody's bike book. And it was like eight ninety five, And that was like my Bible for how to fix my bike. And I learned everything self-taught. You know, but, so. but, but you you know, Doug, and I'm I'm glad you you brought in the word help. Um, where in the race, right, in the Ironman triathlon, right. if, if someone helps you, yeah. you are disqualified. Yeah, you're done. You're done. But yeah. but the theme I'm listening is starting from swimming in a pool, yeah. <laughs> where you realize, man, I I'm, I suck. But, <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, yeah. the theme of you you asking for help um, was there a, a process? That, you know, did you have any pride where you had to go? All right, I, I need help, and and you know what? I got to just get rid of my pride. That guy just blew past me. He was texting in his nineteen eighties. Yeah. <laughs> No, talk then, to me about the word help and, and how, what you learn from that and how does that benefit you? What I learned from it was, I mean, the Ironman is very much an individual event. I mean, nobody else is going to swim for you, or ride for you, or, you know, it's not a relay or you can switch off. It's all individual. But there's absolutely no way that I would have accomplished it had I had not had the swimming coaching um, I asked for help from a guy who I met in Winnipeg and we would go on rides every weekend together, long, long rides, like hundred mile rides and, you know, which you don't want to do by yourself. And I learned a lot from him. Um, and I discovered early on that asking for help is probably one of the quickest ways to leapfrog forward in life, you mm-hmm. know, because, and I don't think I ever came to a, um, a conscious realization of that. It just kind of evolved. And as I went through my life later on, you know, I decided to become a golf pro when I was 44 years old and play on the PGA Tour. Now, that's not exactly a realistic goal, but I asked for everything I needed and I got it only because I asked for it. And if I didn't ask for it, that goal would never have come to fruition. I know we kind of got off topic a little bit from the Ironman, but but that, well, I was 25 when I did that. And, and so everything I've done in life has always been with the support of other people. It's never been about me, but I'm the one who's like on the bike riding, you know? Yeah. Well, well, that's what, well, you know, and I, I actually, I believe it's, it's relevant because, you know, what I did not know is that you can ask for help up until the event. Yes. And yeah. then the event, if yeah. you ask for help, you're doomed. Yeah. You're yeah. And yeah. so and, and, I, and, and so if, if you don't mind, I like to tie that into um, something. L- ladies and gentlemen, I'll, I'll let Doug kind of give you the accurate stats, but he's he's been doing push ups for uh, 38 years. And in, in, in right now, his uh, his I think his total total I'm exaggerating his total is. Uh. is but but honestly, going into the help and training for the swim and the cycle to run and listening to how you, you know, that one word help has helped you. Um, how, how, what are you doing now to also demonstrate to first responders and veterans and other people, the power of just asking for help where you don't have to be like, life is not the Ironman triathlon where if you do ask for help, you won't be disqualified in life. Right. Yeah, that's very true. And and asking for help is definitely a choice. And not asking for help is also a choice. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when I first talked with you, we talked about this a little bit, you know, the, that I've noticed that more prevalent with veterans that they have a harder time asking for help. Um, but civilians do as well. And many of them are stuck because of that. And the first experience we had in helping a veteran was my wife and I in our real estate business got a phone call from uh, some organization that was supporting veterans. And they said, 
you know, can you guys come up with a bed for this veteran? And we said, sure, you know, we got a bed and we delivered it to this uh, apartment. And it was for a veteran who'd been living um, on the street and had finally got enough, uh, or I guess in his car, and got enough money to pay the down payment for his rent and his, you know, first uh, first um, month's rent and security deposit. But he didn't have anything other than what was in his car. Right. Well, so bed is like you're probably your first thing you'd want to have. Imagine if you're moving into an empty place, what would you want first? Well, it'd be a bed. So we drop it off and, uh, you know, we say, well, is there anything else we can help it? No, no, I'm good. <laughs> because of that whole pride thing, I don't want to ask for help and whatever. And so over the course of the next couple of years from that time, we've completely outfitted about 15 apartments with everything. I mean, completely. And that's largely to the uh, generosity of our clients who, when they would move, they'd have things that they couldn't use anymore. So we would repurpose them and put them in storage. And then we'd get the call and we'd rent a U-Haul and we'd deliver it. Um, but the the most uh, um, the time that it really hit me was there was a young Marine and he was probably in his mid thirties. He had a couple of kids and he got a, our phone number from this organization. You know, call them and they can help. So he called and uh, we had a whole garage full of stuff. And we rented a U-Haul and he shows up to our garage and we're loading it all up in the truck. And he muttered under his breath. I wish I'd called earlier. And I said, well, how long have you been waiting to call? <laughs> he said, six months. Now imagine you're living in an apartment with, you know, two young kids. You don't have all the furniture you need. But for whatever reason, you know, he didn't make that call. And not a judgment. It's just the way it is, you know. And I said to him, like, do you realize that you're actually giving me a gift by calling so that I can help you. And he, he, it was foreign to him. And I said, you're a Marine, you know, when you're in the Marines active duty and your battle buddy asks you for help, what would you do? Well, of course I would like jump right in. And then I said to him, well, how did that make you feel when your battle buddy asks you for help? And he said, made me feel really good. I said, do you have, times where your kids ask you for things and <laughs> he laughed like every day right well how does that make you feel and he said it makes me feel really good i can give to my kids so i said let's flip that around like when you ask me as a civilian for help how do you think it makes me feel and that's when the light bulb went off you know and he's like you're giving me a gift by asking for help because we want to help you we just don't know how and if you give us a specific request, it's done. Right? And so in life, whatever it is that we want, if we have the courage to just ask for it, it's there. And it's yeah. specific you ask, the quicker it comes. Yeah. No, I and, and I like that we're we're like you said, the person believes if they ask for help, they're a burden. But yeah. On the other end, the receiver is going, if you ask me for help, it's actually a gift and Absolutely. give me an opportunity. That what what amazing. And look at what happened, you know, with you. You know, again, here it is. You're in you're in a very warm place. We know it, you're in a cold place. You know, ten, <laughs> t ten days before this major event, you know, and you get acclimatized to to a completely different arena. And then, and then you accomplish with uh, with a lot of folks. Top twenty percent, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, he finished um, that uh, nineteen eighty two Ironman triathlon in Hawaii. Again, swimming two point four miles, cycling one hundred twelve, and running twenty six point two. Looking back on that journey, mm -hmm. at any time during the race, did you want to quit? <laughs> Uh, I never wanted to quit, but I definitely had times where I was wondering, can I do this? <laughs> uh, the first one was standing on the beach with 850 or so athletes, you know, that are all pretty finely tuned. There's not a lot of fat <laughs> or showing up on that beach and, uh, wondering, you know, what is going on? 
can I do this? You know, so you, you can't be human and not have those questions going on through your mind. Cause I'd never swam the full 2.4 miles, even in the pool, much less in the ocean. I'd done the ride a couple of times. I'd done lots of marathons, but putting all three together is a whole different deal. Yeah. The time that it really got me was I got through the swim and I'm just like terrible in the swim. I mean, I got out of the water like 640th place or something out of 850, way behind. I would probably still be in the water. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> was, uh, but I got through it and I got on my bike and I got a new surge of energy. And I just said to myself, which I couldn't do in the swim, I'm just going to take the next person in front of me and pass them and try not to let anybody pass me. That was my mindset. So I was always looking, you know, 50 yards down the road rather than, oh, my God, I got to do all this. Right. I focused on just like that one person in front of me. OK, go get that person. Once I got that person, then I go to the next person. That's how I kind of um, occupied my mind, because the other thing people don't understand is like you watch the Tour de France or the big cycling races and there's, you know, all these people in a big pack and you're in the middle of that pack, you almost don't even have to pedal. You're just like getting sucked through by like a vacuum through that. But when you're fighting 25 mile an hour trade winds and you can't be within two bike lengths of anybody else or you're disqualified, there's no drafting effect. Right. So riding that is a lot, lot harder than it is in a typical bike race. Um, but there was a moment and it was about mile 80 in the race and there wasn't anybody in front of me to track down. You know, we kind of separated out. And, you know, when you look in movies and they show this heat mirage in the desert and, you know, you can't really determine if something is water or land. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. That's exactly what I was going through on the bike. I'm looking down this black road through the black lava fields of Hawaii. There's no trees. There's no vegetation. It's just it's quite an environment. Um, nobody in front of me. And so I started to hallucinate, you know, I'm wondering like, where, am I on the road? <laughs> We're going to run into water. And then, you know, I started doing this mental calculation in my brain. I'm at mile 80. So I still have 32 miles left to go on the bike, which is not nothing. And then I got to run a marathon after that. So I started to have this self doubt, you know, could I accomplishment, and then all of a sudden, somebody appears out of nowhere in front. And I went, I tracked that person down. And then I was like, right back on. So that whole segment lasted for maybe a minute or two where I really had significant doubts as to whether I could do it. And then once I got onto the run, which was my specialty, and I actually had the 10th fastest run time that year. Um, and nobody passed me on the run. I mean, I just kept knocking off people and, you know, finished in 181 from the 640th place when I came out of the water. Uh, but even that, you know, having run several marathons before, marathon runners out there will know that mile 20 is kind of like the halfway mark in a 26.2 mile run, which doesn't make any sense logically. But that's at a point where your body starts to just like break down and you start having all these doubts. Right. It wasn't until I got to mile 25 that I knew I can do this. That's when I knew. And I ran the last mile, like yelling and screaming and hooping, hollering, my arms raised like this. I'm going like this the whole last mile. I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> yeah. That is, you know, and, and just listening to this journey, you know, how you start off with, I don't know exactly what this is about, but, but I'm going to do it. And then yeah. you just you just go for it and learn as you go. Then you ask for help. You have some moments where they're kind of embarrassing. Like you said, you know, here you are thinking you're, you know, you're you're doing 25, we'll just say 25 miles per hour. And a guy blows past you doing 50 going, yeah. hey, I'll have some decaf when you get back. You, know, you <laughs> make my coffee. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then, of course, you, you have the race itself where you experience uh, emotions that are natural to humans. Uh, you know, yeah. self-doubt. You know, why am I doing this? Can I do this? And, and then you choose this way of thinking um, that you can achieve whatever you put your mind to and essentially um, and, and essentially accomplish something that's bigger, bigger than you, me and everyone else. If you had something to leave the listeners and viewers, if you had one piece of advice to leave them today, 
what would that be? What would that be, Doug? Um, I'll really relate this back to the Ironman. When I decided to do this, there was no internet. There was no training manual. There's no triathlon club. There's no coaches. We're figuring it out completely on our own. We're pioneers, right? So when you have that task, you have to kind of break it down. And I created this training journal. And every Sunday night, I would sit down and I would write down what, or I would assess what happened the last, the week before, you know, and I'd have it in three columns, my swim column, my cycle column, my ride column. And on Sunday night, I would, I would plan what I was going to do next week for my training. And it was just one week, but I made a commitment to myself to do that no matter what. And then next Sunday I can adjust. Some days it was a two mile run, which I wasn't even breaking a sweat. Some days it was riding a hundred miles. Some days it was, you know, swimming a mile in the pool. The key for me was that no matter what I said I was going to do that day, I finished that every single day. And I was training my mind probably more than I was my body. Now imagine when you're running in the middle of uh, January in Winnipeg and it's minus 30 degrees, that's not really training for the Ironman because, you know, it's not it. But when I, if I said I was going to run eight miles that day and I finished that, what am I doing in my mind? I'm saying, okay, whatever I say I'm going to do, yeah. I can do that, right? And my only quote I've ever come up with in life is, to develop power in your life, say you're going to do something and then do it. So what I trick my brain into thinking, like when I said when I was standing on the beach on the day of the Ironman, it was like, you know, of course you have doubts. Can you do this? Because it's such a monumental thing. Right. But for the last year and a half, every single day I said I was going to do something, I did it. Today is no different. It's no different than a, writing down in my journal, I'm going to run two miles today. Just happened to be a little longer today. <laughs> but had I wavered during the year and a half of training for that specific day, and some days I would do it, some days I wouldn't. Now, how do you think my mind would be on the beach that day? It would be wondering, well, you know, you've never done this before. You know, you haven't always done what you said you were going to do. I would, no way I would have finished the race. Right. Wow. So, if if you If you write it down, ladies and gentlemen, you know, hold yourself accountable, yeah. fin finish it, make adjustments, but write it down, make the choice to finish what you say um, yeah. you're going to do. Um, it, that's, that's, where, that's where the power comes from. That is, that is the choice. Doug, I believe there's a lot of people um, who would love to learn more from you, find you out there on the internet. How can they find Doug Davison? Um, best places goes to my website, which is powerfromtheheart.net. Um, I'm also on Facebook, Instagram, just, you know, search my name. It's pretty simple. Unfortunately, there is one uh, um, daytime soap opera guy who has his same name as me. So he gets the first 10 pages on everything else. But someday I'll pass him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I'll help you get past him. We'll develop those search engine optimization yeah. to get past that guy. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Hey, Doug, well, I, you know, in general, by the way, you know, I always okay. call you my general, but I truly enjoyed uh, hosting you. I, I appreciate you removing your armor and thank you so much uh, for sharing some of those inside your know, right journeys and experiences that we would never know about you. Uh, thank you so much. It's been an honor to be with you here today and can't wait to get to know you a little bit better. Yes, yeah, same here. Well, ladies and gentlemen, again, the links will be in the show notes. Um, in the audio and the video. We'll see you guys in a couple more weeks. Until then, God bless you all. Be safe. We'll see you soon.